Okay, so she has worked uh, as a psychiatrist in Belgium, then California for 35 years in private practice, community hospitals, and uh, nonprofit organizations geared to help vulnerable populations. She was associate professor of psychiatry at UCLA until 2016. She worked with women and men with wide range, wide ranging struggles, diagnosis, and life journeys. She values humility, curiosity, and flexibility in as a uh, clinician's essential tools and qualities. So over to you, Dr. Bernadette. Thank you so much, uh, Faiza. I'm going to share my screen. Thank you so much uh, for, for inviting me. And um, I think it's very interesting for me. I, I couldn't be here yesterday. I uh, was at another conference, but to hear uh, Jess Hazel uh, and, um, and Connor, uh, I think my, my, in my talks, you will hear some echoes of uh, their, their talks and a little bit of reframing too. And as again, I'm coming here as a clinician. There's been 35 years that I've worked with adult uh, patient in psychiatry, in inpatient, ER, outpatient, as you said, in, in two different countries. So context is everything. Uh, and being aware of history, in particular in medicine, is I think one of the best way uh, to learn from mistakes and uh, prevent repetition of mistakes. And the history of autism is one of the many examples uh, how many society, when they're confronted with various differences that they don't uh, necessarily understand or cannot tolerate, can pathologize and other uh, the other person, the different person, and in doing so, sometimes facilitate to authorize some forms of abuse, exclusion, or eradication. Uh, Asperger. Uh, who, even if may have saved a few autistic children uh, from euthanasia, we know that he sent a majority of what he called feeble-minded, those who were not wired well enough to, to be good Nazi in Austria in the 40s. He sent them to the Spiegel Grand Clinic where these children were euthanized. In the 50s, Bruno Bettelheim, who lied about his credential, he was not a psychologist, he was not a psychoanalyst, he lied on his immigration papers, made up his theory uh, where he compared mothers of autistic children to the Nazi guards he had encountered in concentration camps. And he blamed them uh, for the, children, uh, the children's autism. He also argued that autistic children were empty and devoid of humanity. He became incredibly popular, particularly in, uh, in Europe. Uh, I bought his books in the 80s when I was studying myself. And even if his colleagues had realized he was probably not a psychoanalyst and make fun of him behind closed door, nobody confronted that man. And they let him uh, having his writing destroying basically the lives of countless autistic children and their families. And then uh, soon uh, came another form of dehumanization, literally. Lovas, who is the originator of ABA, justified the use of physical emotion, emotional violence in uh, what uh, Sequentia called emotional, uh, I called, uh, I'm sorry, autistic conversion therapy. And he said that it was fine to do this very violent treatment at time because in his words, in, in 1974, with an autistic child, you have a person in the physical sense, they have hair, a nose, and a mouth but they are not people in the psychological sense. I'm not making up any of this. I'm not darkening the picture. It is in the book, the medical journals, the psychoanalytical reviews. And I'm saying this because it explains many of the enduring stereotypes that are related to autism. It's written in our collective conscious and including the one of parents and healthcare providers, including psychiatrists to this day. Of course, during these times, all these times, there were also wonderful people, incredibly dedicated and caring, who were helping autistic children and their families. But as usual, they are not the one that history remember most. So was it some progress? Uh, there were some progress made in the last two decades, thanks to disability rights advocates, open-minded researchers, autistic families, and later and today, autistic people themselves who found the voice and were able to amplify that voice in part thanks to internet. 
And today, thanks to you, uh, you are giving us and me a voice. But the weight of old beliefs endures, as illustrated by the infamous 2009 clip, I Am Autism, uh, which is literally a three minute, 43 second of an oral movie where some name autism is represented and an incredibly creepy, sadistic monster within the child that will destroy that child and the family. Once again, autistic people were represented with an empty shells with faces devoid of thought, feeling, or agency. That was just 10 years ago. Prevalent was also the devastating myth that autistic people lacked capacity for empathy or theory of mind. The ability to guess spontaneously what was happening in another person's mind, similar to the one of the researchers that was called having a theory of mind, like them. Uh, and it became, and I take their word, the quintessential ability that would make us human. So at the same time, they were defining something that was making people humans, and they were saying that autistic people didn't have that quality. The othering had no end. And when people like Temple Grandin or Donna Williams wrote memoirs recounting their difficult journeys and their trauma as autistic people, their voices were often disqualified because they didn't fit that model. So we need a change in paradigm, and, and we need many change in many paradigm. Another change, and Connor touched to this a little bit, is to address the epidemic or the pseudo epidemic of autism. There's no real epidemic, of course, as autism is no more contagious than homosexuality or left-handedness or having blue eyes. But like for any stigmatizing difference in history, like left-handedness or being gay, People need to feel safe to come out in surveys and even come out to themselves. As an example, being left-handed was heavily stigmatized for centuries. You could be burned for, for it. You were considered a psychopath. They would put you in jail. They would prevent you to teach. But once the prejudice disappeared or was not as powerful as you see here, starting in the 20s and the 40s in the US, you had an epidemic of left-handed people. Right? I think something very similar is happening regarding autism, in addition to the fact that we're learning more and more to recognize it. So why do we, um, I'm sorry. And another myth uh, was that uh, autism was always linked to intellectual disability. And that was one of the reasons why uh, we wouldn't recognize a lot of autistic people who don't have uh, this uh, intellectual disability, which in the past we took were up to 60% or 50% of the autistic population. And uh, some data now show that factor is probably more around 10%. Uh, that means that we have a lot of autistic people who are not identified as such, who are generally misdiagnosed we will, or ignored, and we will see uh, what we can do about that. Another reason why we need a change in par paradigm is because accurate teaching about autism is missing. I did med school in Belgium in residency, didn't hear anything about it except about children and young boys. Uh, we did a residency at UCLA in the, in the year 2000. Again, we had not much information or not at all about autism, certainly not about autism in adults. We need to change the paradigm because if someone disclosed a uh, patient would disclose to a doctor that uh, she's autistic. Suddenly, the doctor may not take that person seriously or may attribute it most of the problems to autism. Uh, if a doctor disclosed they're autistic, they lose patients who doesn't trust her or him anymore. And I think it's a big, big issue that's coming now. It's a lot of young people have been diagnosed as or identified as autistic. Uh, because we identify it more easily now, and they want to become healthcare worker. And when they want to become healthcare worker, if the people who give them, who teach them, who evaluate them, are still stuck with the old stereotypes with autism, they may say, you know, you cannot be a psychiatrist, you have no empathy, you have no terror of mind. We know that it's not accurate, but it's still what the majority of psychiatrists think. So how do we do to uh, uh, un unmask this uh, stereotype? Well, let's see. Uh, here we see that, I'm sorry. Yeah, how do we change the paradigm? I'm sorry. We denounce these false myths 
And that's what we're doing. And thank you so much again for doing that today. We can work from inside. And you see here lots of uh, autistic uh, writer, Washington Post writer, Eric Garcia, great book. Uh, Fern Brady, you see uh, recently a soccer player came out. So we can come out and fight from inside and certainly informing and participating to research. I think the next talk will be uh, about that. I put here the work of Yergo uh, about clinically significant disturbance, really how she explained how the myth of theory of mind have been, has been devastating uh, for autistic people. So let's unmask a few stereotypes, and you're probably familiar with that already if you've been following these days, but it's always good to have a refresher. So autism is not an illness, it's a neurodevelopmental difference. We have a lot of autistic adults, with, uh, autistic don't suddenly disappear after 18. It's certainly not rare. At this point, it's 2%, probably more than that. Autistic people have in general hyper empathy, hyper emotional empathy, which is different from cognitive empathy. We'll see that later. Uh, and they have a theory of mind. Of course, we have mine. Uh, it's just not the one that the researcher in the past didn't imagine, in fact. It's present in both sexes and women, probably one woman for three men. Again, that's probably an underestimation. Every age, religion, every minority, every level of disability and ability. So you, if you are a, a, a practitioner, if you work, you have them I mean, in your practice. I mean, you don't know that the person is a disability, but you certainly are part of your practice and your friends and your teacher and your doctor. We are everywhere. Uh, there is a sole representation in the LGBTQ population. The symptoms and the range of symptoms will be very different uh, depending of, of course, the, the environment, the age, and so forth. And when you don't have major intellectual disability, a lot of people read, write, communicate, uh, and uh, able to work. Now, the very big issue and why we need absolutely to identify autistic people and be able to help them to go to access to care, to access to proper care, is as you see the average life expectancy. I have in my number shorter by 20 years. I know Connor say 15. Uh, we know for autistic uh, individuals with, with disability, you know, it is important disability, the life expectancy is sometimes shortened by 36 years. It's an incredible numbers. First, because of that is cardiovascular disease, I think because probably difficult access to care. Also, as we will see, generally uh, being autistic and living in a world that's not necessarily made for you, uh, create a constant, constant state of stress. And constant state of stress increase your blood pressure and give you a lot of cardiovascular problems. The other reason why we really have to be better at identifying autistic people is that suicide is the second leading cause of death. The second in the general population is 11 or 12 cause of death. As I said, it's in general very hard to receive proper treatment. So how can we uh, find the autism? I'm sorry, I have a problem to... Uh... <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Um, we're going to look uh, in a different way that has been uh, presented uh, so far. Uh, we're not going to look into the DSM way because the DSM is a model was essentially a model of deficit and only is looking at one part of an individual, but it's absolutely not the entire person. One more way of dehumanizing people. Um, and the problem uh, with this uh, definition and with the research we're looking at autistic without attributing to them a mind and a, a feelings and way of thinking is that uh, we again order them. We don't really recognize who is uh, autistic as a full person. And I'm using uh, this uh, philosopher uh, to criticize the behavioral model and the DSM model, where we think that we can define someone only by what they look like from outside. And in the 1974, uh, Thomas Nagel uh, was a philosopher and was really upset at the reductionist euphoria uh, of the behaviorist. He uh, wrote this essay, What It Is To Be A Bat. And in that, he assumed that every organism as some form of conscious experience of what it is to be an organism, or what it is to be a bat, if you are a bat. And that experience is it's not something you can analyze purely in terms of 
uh, behavior or functional state. It's not something you can analyze just from outside. And so, uh, as he explained, if, if you imagine what it is to be a bat and perceive to see be through a sonar, for instance, you really don't know exactly what it is to be a bat. To know what it is, you, you need to take the bat point of view. And I suppose you see where I'm coming, uh, that for people to have a real sense of what's happening inside an autistic person, uh, it's very important to take into account autistic narratives. Uh, as um, Jan Hacking, a philosopher who recently died, is reminding us by looking at these narratives, we can have a better experience of what it is the experience of being autistic. And so another way to change paradigm, as I said, is for people to come out uh, and explain what it is. The famous example is when Temple Grandin did that in 1985 and suddenly gave to parents and families a place of autism of someone who was articulate, who explained things, and was this human person among them and gave them a lot of hope. Alexis Quinn, that will, will speak in uh, this afternoon, uh, and I really highly recommend her book, Unbroken, where she experienced her experience and as an autistic person within the mental health system in England, a pretty harrowing uh, experience. And I really think that anybody working in psychiatry should read this book and realize how we can, by lack of understanding, make horrible uh, mistakes. Mary Doherty uh, is the one who creates uh, Autistic Doctor International a few years ago, I come, come out as a doctor, autistic doctors and opened the door to hundreds now of doctors who came out and participate in changing the narrative around autism. And it's uh, something that I'm doing today, being a member myself of Autistic Doctor International, that's literally at uh, 11, that you see. So if I share with you my perspective today, as a psychiatrist with 35 years of practice, I share it also with the mind of an autistic person. That means I look at uh, every tree before considering the forest. I'm very good at noticing unfamiliar patterns and I'm making contact connections, I just did, between fact and events who may not be obvious at the beginning. By sharing with you that I am autistic, I'm also taking a risk. I'm taking a risk that you may dismay what I say on the account of me being different. This is the weird logic of what we call epistemic injustice when people often from a minority are questioning their ability to speak and share knowledge about themselves, about their condition, under the pretext that the witness may be biased, which is probably true, I am biased, but so are all the other researchers and psychiatrists, we're all biased. Hopefully for most of you, my additional feature uh, may increase your interest. But because the word autism, as I said earlier, is associated with so many stereotypes, you may be tempted consciously or unconsciously to disqualify some of my observations. If you do, please be aware of it, write it down, keep listening and bring that to the discussion. Another way to operate a paradigm change is to change the tools we are using. Uh, Andre Lord in the 70s also was uh, cautioning scholars who were seeking to use the traditional social science research tools to achieve social justice and health equality. I think she was right. Remember the DSM wording and it's essentially deficit perspective. I think we need new tools, new paradigm, new words to speak about autism, including in psychiatry. And luckily we have some. Right? We have a big change in paradigm in the 70s when we realized that oh, autism was not because of horrible mother, but it's actually a very big genetic factor in this. In the 80s, we realized that girls can also be autistic. Uh, in 96, autistic sociologist Judy Singer coined the word neurodiversity. So here's a new word. Uh, Cassian Sumasu coined neurodivergent. And uh, Damian Milton, I think, made an incredible a change for everybody by publishing the double empathy problem and explaining how autistic people have empathy too. And we will come back to that in a little bit. So words, do we say a person with autism or an autistic person? And why would I say one more than the other? I personally person prefer saying I'm autistic and I'm an autistic person because it's part of who I am. I am a woman. 
right? I'm not a person who is womanness. It's written in my biology. It's not something that can be taken away from me and certainly uh, not something absolutely horrible that they need to take, to be, you know, take away from me. We prefer to use the term non-speaking in place of non-verbal. The fact that you don't speak doesn't mean you cannot express yourself sometimes extremely well and communicate with the world. And of course, this is in general necessary to give us self humanity. It seems we are not ready to give humanity sometimes to people who cannot communicate it in a way we understand. So neurodiversity is the scientific truth, right? Like biodiversity, we are all neurodiverse. Uh, but there are some people whose brain is similar to the majority of the other fellow human beings, which we call neurotypical, and then minorities called neurodivergent, of which autism is part. An important change in wording, too, about label, uh, the, the word low functioning and uh, high functioning that you know as some may use. I think the difficulty when you use low functioning or severe, it's you can have a general dismissing of the future person ability or their specific abilities. And you can not only prevent people to have hope because a lot of autistic people in their own time will develop a lot of different capacities. And if you think of Temper Grandin, for instance, at two years old, and she's not the only one, and she was, uh, diagnosed by a doctor with brain damage to told the family, you know, you should uh, you should just send her in an institution and forget about her. I think goodness the mother didn't do that. And we know what happened to Temple Grand and, and what, how much she brought to the community. Uh, there are many examples uh, of this, like uh, uh, this uh, young professor at Cambridge who was uh, not speaking until uh, 14 years old and is now professor at, at, at Cambridge, I was looking for his name. Um, the qualifier high functioning is also a problem because it seems to mean that we don't have problems to adapt and that pretending to be normal, uh, try to fit is not costing in terms of physical and emotional energy. And it is costing. It's like, imagine when you were, visit a, a foreign country, you have to speak a different language that you don't necessarily master, certainly not at the beginning. It is exhausting. Well, for many autistic people living in a non-autistic society, that's what's happening constantly. And all misunderstanding and difficulties in communication are the source of anxiety, of burnout, and a lot of probably suicidal ideation. <clears throat> so if we want to look at autism, my, my way to look at it is that it's a different way, and Tim imagined this, of perceiving, processing, learning, thinking, and relating in reaction to both what's happening inside of us and outside of us. And the way I'm going to describe the things now is looking through all these characteristics. Um, so the first part is uh, looking at perception. Perception is at the beginning of everything. And perception, thankfully, to the, to the DSM-5, um, is really something where the autistic person is a huge difference compared to the non-autistic population. So our human brain processes, did you know that? 11 million sensory impressions per second, 11 million. Maybe why is it such a big brain? But the consciousness of it, it's only about four of 50 of them. Um, no, what, what we think is that autistic people are probably perceiving and being conscious of more than that. I have no idea if it's 80 to 90 or to 100, but generally people are conscious of 40 or 50 perception at the same time, and autistic people are receiving more than that, many more than that. And that was the reason why you will see there are a lot of difference in perception. A typical sensory experience, a report, I would say almost to the entire, in the entire autistic population. There are lifelong characteristics, which is very important to try to make a diagnosis because if an adult come to you, they've been adapted long enough, they've learned to make eye contact, to fake it. They've learned to take turns in conversation, all kinds of things that may not have been spontaneous. And so that's why so many psychiatrists would tell a patient, you know, you're not autistic, you're making eye contact, you're smiling at me, right? But there are a lot of things you learn as a foreign language. 
uh, sensory, if you ask question about the sensory sensitivities, you probably will have responses that will help you to identify autism. So as I said, autistic people have high level of perceptual capacity. Uh, so we get more, more perception at the same time. And what's extremely important is to be aware also that we have a reduction in habituation. So in general, if you have a light or if you have a noise that's irritating, most of people forget about it, right? After a while, you get used to it and you don't hear it or you don't see it. It doesn't happen that way for an autistic person. That noise of a vacuum, that noise of a fridge. I was giving a lecture yesterday. The lights were making a lot of noise and I had to listen to it for seven or eight hours. My brain didn't turn that off. It's not able to do it. So when we tell people, you know, just forget about it. Well, it's exactly something we cannot do. And as you realize, that can increase your fatigue and your exhaustion. I'm sorry. What is that? All right. So first uh, perception I want to look at uh, is vision. And, you know, there's this big obsession about eye contact, at least in our culture, right? It's very important for uh, the normalization of autistic children or other to teach them to make eye contact. Well, we know one of the reasons why making eye contact is so difficult, and re remember, we perceive more, uh, is that, and we've seen that now, we don't necessarily believe the word of autistic people would say, you know, it's really hard for me to look you in the eyes. Well, we have neuroimaging showing that uh, eye contact increase the amygdala activity. The amygdala, and we mentioned it earlier, is kind of our emotional brain or primitive brain, that the center of fear or fight flight. So this is the sign that you're really anxious, really stressed. And we see that's what eye contact is doing when you force it to an autistic person. There are also a lot of characteristics. I'm not gonna go into all details, but certain sensitivity to certain type of lighting, fascination also to color. And another sign you may be curious of is a lot of autistic people, maybe because they see the details before the forest, have what we call prosopagnosia, face blindness, probably up to 30, 35% you don't recognize people or it takes you a long time to finally identify someone, which can be a problem in social setting. Now, I wanna show you when I heard uh, how uh, autistic people tend to look at the mouth uh, and more and more at the eyes. And again, if you have difficulty processing information, it makes sense that you prefer looking at the mouth. Uh, but I want to uh, give you this example and this video may a little bit stressful, so be ready to turn it off uh, uh, or turn the sound off. This is a, a play uh, by Samuel Beckett. You know, Samuel Beckett was most probably autistic. And it's very interesting that he did this play, this play where you see only the mouth talking. You don't see the person who is doing that. And I want you to look at this for 15 seconds. I would like to call it and on the to the input in the home. No, we need to not have any pain. No, we have any pain. And it's such a big day. So, if you have everybody knows that I'm not the sixty one. What? What is it? God. We got to have to do it. And then, if the baby is such a little bit of a step in the stuff, it's going to space. And I think what? Okay, I stop there. How do you feel? Right. I think it, I type. I feel relatively stressful. Well, it was so stressful for people in London when the play was show that a lot of the people were trying to escape. Uh, they were trying to escape to the bathroom, they were trying to escape in different places, but they uh, locked the door probably against so uh, good practice. And uh, this was a play that was incredibly uh, stressful for people. So you now think of children, for, some, for instance, or adults that don't have ways to escape, no ways to communicate better, and who are forced to sustain eye contact for minutes and minutes. Think of their amygdala and their upper arousal and their pain, and for what? Another perception that's very important, of course, is hearing. 
And that's also a place where uh, autistic people have in general hyperacuity, right? All the sensory perception you may sometimes as hypo or hyper. The hyper is, of course, generally more clearly uh, disturbing. Uh, what is very difficult is like sudden world, sudden uh, unexpected uh, noise, like a dog barking, right? High pitched and continuous vacuum cleaner, sunlight, uh, and complex. So when um, they send, I, um, uh, Alexi may talk about that when her first way to get out of the psychiatric unit uh, to see how she would behave uh, outside was to send her in the department stores. That was crazy. How do you send people who are hypersensitive to sound, to light, to things that are unexpected? And the first walk out should be in the forest, right? Not in a department store. Again, delayed habituation, so you don't get used to it. Great sensitivity to the tone of voice. So when you work, and if you work with someone who is autistic, be very careful. First, we don't necessarily have a sense of how our voice sounds. And since we don't necessarily express what's happening inside, it may be confusing for the other person. Um, and sometimes if your voice is even just a little bit irritated, a little bit anxious, that can be perceived at 300% by an autistic person and make things very difficult and make you shut up, for instance. And of course, each time, because this sensory channel is bringing so much uh, at the same time, each time it's harder to focus on one thing at a time. Uh, similarly, smell, taste, hyper, hypersensitivity, that can make you a great chef, but that can also prevent you to work, you know, in some circumstance. Or you have a colleague in the office who is wearing a lot of perfume. Or you are asked as a job, you know, why don't you do, why don't you become a hairdresser? Right, you work in a nail salon. Well, it's really hard to do that when you're hypersensitive to, to smells. So take that into account, and we will see that it influences, of course, a lot of eating problems, eating disorders, uh, because of this hypersensitivity. Touch is also something extremely important. Uh, it's an important comment on many social and intimate experience. Uh, autistic people may notice a very light pressure on the skin that someone else would not feel, and you certainly not feel as painful. Uh, and these difficulties with touch, um, thermal sensitivity is common, may create avoidance. You don't go to a doctor and you certainly don't go to a dentist because this is so scary, so noisy, so much light, right? And it's a big issue in the autistic community uh, to be able to have regular dental care. Now, why is that? Why do we have a, a difference in perception of, of touch and how we interpret touch? Well, one... Uh, uh, explanation uh, may be that we have two different types of fibers who, who transport the information about touch. One are the type A fibers who go to the brain sensory centers. That's when you feel pressure, vibration, stretching of the skin. Then we have also much thinny fiber type C, which are in the skin, only in the skin that has hair, uh, and they register not in sensory center, but in emotion center in the brain, which is very interesting. And we think that for autistic people, there is something different, something unusual with the nerve C uh, fibers. And <clears throat> about pain, right? It's also transmitting pain. As I said at the very beginning, one of the myths was that, oh, these people, they don't feel anything. They don't feel pain. We can slap the kids. They don't feel anything. I mean, how could yeah, that be even possible to imagine things that way? Of course, and again, uh, autistic people perceive pain. It's an atypical perception of pain. It's in general a combination of an increase of the pain signal and a less effective pain inhibition. She's telling you we feel more pain in general. Uh, it's also important to see that sensory and cognitive experiences of pain are heightened, so they encourage one another and to interact reciprocally. So you have an increase of uh, physical and emotional pain that's like adding to one another. Uh, there are so, and those are MRI studies show that a uh, high anticipation to pain. So when you know you're gonna be hurt, it, you feel it even more uh, than someone who is not autistic. Now, 
Again, not going to detail with everything else, but you know about interoception. That was telling us what's happening inside of our body. And we know that here again, there are difference. One of the very uh, crucial difference to be aware of is that sometimes difficult to perceive that something is wrong inside of us. And if you have alexithymia, if you don't know really very well how to express what's going on, you can go to an emergency room with a burst appendix. You will tell the doctor you think you are in pain. You will not show the signal of that pain. You yourself are not sure if you are much in pain or not. And the great danger is you send back home where you die from peritonitis because nobody took you seriously. So that's why every health professional, not just psychiatrist, physician, nurse, everybody need to be aware that if someone is autistic, the way they describe what's inside their body is different, important for the family also to advocate for their family member. The result of all that, of course, is that you can have a sensory overload and that can be making you very anxious. Uh, you know, you may not want to participate. Things like that. And unfortunately, operative as doesn't want to work with resistance, who is not compliant. And it is not the problem, but that's how it can be perceived. Motricity is also different, uh, and uh, we have difficulties with fine motor skills, and we had all the, the wonderful just exposed it before, a uh, problem with posture and balance. Of course, all that also make you really a target for bullies uh, in school, uh, or for the police who think that you walk in a strange way and you're probably drunk. Um, some sport, very important to know if you're autistic or your children are, some sport are better and actually very uh, good for you because it's a very good way to let go of a lot of tension and energy, swimming, trampoline, walking, playing golf, horseback riding. And then we had earlier this mention of catatonia, which is extremely important. I will come back to it. Uh, 12 to 20%, we say maybe up to 30% of autistic people may present an episode of catatonia. And the tragedy of that is that the old belief it's still a uh, thinking catatonia, schizophrenia, which is not true, it's maybe 10%, uh, and give antipsychotic to the autistic person, which is going to make it much worse, and we'll come back to that briefly. Now, you're probably familiar, and here again, Beckett, if you've read Murphy, or if you've not, please do, uh, we describe really self-soothing behavior. Uh, stimming is a way uh, to calming oneself, to protect yourself against overstimulation, help to concentrate, express feeling, feeling. And you have a different example of that. But I'm saying this because it's so important. Don't force the person, except it's something that's really hurtful, don't prevent them to stim. That's really the way to avoid a crisis. That's a way to be calmer and to concentrate. So stimming is something very important, again, not to be extinguished. Now you have a better sense how people are feeling and experiencing the world. And I imagine you see how it affects, you know, emotional regulation, uh, behavioral problems. Let's see how we think, because of course we think uh, and cognitive process our series of chemical and electrical signal in the brain and remember in the gut. That's why diet can be so important for so many uh, psychiatric and medical problems. Uh, and cognition so increase all these different uh, part of us, attention, doubt, memory. Uh, and what is typical in an autistic person is that they don't develop all these competence at the same time. So you may be excellent with a certain type of memory and not with another. You will be very good at verbal skills, but then when it comes to process something, you are the 30 percentile, 98 for verbal skills. So one characteristics when you do this neurocognitive testing, it takes days and days and are unfortunately too expensive and with too much of a waiting line. Um, you see that spiky profile, it really gives you a good idea that the person is autistic and it helps the autistic person to see what are their strengths and what are the things that it's all right, you have more difficulty, you're not wired that way, right? You see below uh, that person with a verbal skill very high, working memory very low, right? And you see the spikes. That's an autistic profile. The other profile is a neurotypical profile, everything more or less at the same level. I mentioned memories. Memories is what give us an idea of who we are. It was to help us to communicate with people. So it's a lot of influence in our life. 
uh, semantic memory, memory for things, uh, autistic people are generally very good uh, at it. The episodic memory is the conscious recollection of experience in the context, including emotional context, when it was, who I was with, how was I feeling at that time? And that contributes to our autobiographical memory. The autistic person has generally problem with episodic memory. And that's why it's so hard sometimes to give a good history, except if you give a hint. So if you if you ask a bland question, how, how was 2009, person will not remember. If you give them hints, that's when you were in this country doing this and this, then the person will bring a lot of uh, information. It's very important for people working, you know, for police, for instance, realizing that the person doesn't remember is not because you don't want to help, it's just because you don't remember. Different capacities, hyperfocus, difficulty to shift attention, pattern rec recognition, right? Perfectionism, monotropic style, uh, Donna Murray defined that. You're very interested in one thing at, at the time. Um, we see the forest, we see the trees before the forest when you're autistic. Uh, that was called weak central coherence. I will call that acute detention, attention to details. I think we need two people who see the forest and we see people who need the tree first. The same way we need people who see the general point first, top, down, and experience later. And we have people like autistic people going for the bottoms from the trees, from the details to the general perspective. Uh, Tom, Tom Grandin said that's a way why autistic people maybe are less influenceable uh, and make not as much assumption and not autistic people. Here is Beckett again. The style of autistic people have been described different way. Pedantic, I hate that word. I mean, if a child uses a very nice word and is very sophisticated in the use of words, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? But a lot of neologism uh, misuses pronoun important to notice, lose association. By the way, uh, if you read James Joyce that you see on this picture, uh, of course, that make you think of his style. James Joyce being identified as autistic as well. Very literal, very important when you communicate with us, when you ask questions, do you hear voice and someone is speaking in the room next door? Yes, I heard voice, right? I'm not necessarily psychotic. Lack of precision, lack of justice, very difficult to uh, accept. So social language is like a second so, language and it's a language we can learn, but we don't have spontaneously, right? But in the past, it's been said often that, well, the person cannot communicate. So the autistic person is the one responsible for not being able to communicate properly with the word. So they don't have a theory of mind. Well, no, it is not. <laughs> it is not correct, right? And we owe to um, uh, Milton uh, the double empathy problem in theory as a as I described earlier. So of course for autistic person, it may be harder for us to understand or express emotion or read emotion in someone who doesn't have the same neurotype. Uh, but it's difficult for a non-autistic person to understand what's happening in the head of an autistic person, right? So it's easier among neurotype to communicate. That doesn't mean autistic people don't have empathy and don't have theory of mind. And multiple study have now demonstrate that. And in terms of empathy, as I said earlier, you have different type of empathy. We have the cognitive empathy where you can use uh, and, and understand what's going on. Uh, and psychopaths are very good at that. They can read the other rules. They can read people and manipulate them. Autistic people are not very good at cognitive empathy. Affective empathy or emotional empathy is how we, we are, re react to someone else's emotional state. And autistic people in general have hyper empathy, hyper empathy to people, hyper empathy to animals, and sometimes empathy towards objects that are not um, human. So, emotion. Hello? Sorry for interruption, uh, Dr. Bernadette. Sorry for interruption. We are running out of time. You can wrap up quickly. Okay, okay, so um, well, I'm going to be finished with the emotion dysregulation, and you will see the rest of the slides with where you can do a differential diagnosis based on what I just explained. Uh, so we are uh, constantly stressed as a autistic people generally, and we can express that as a meltdown, these big crises that can create a lot of problem, make you diagnose as bipolar or borderline. Uh, here are what you I recommend you to do. Um, the other big problem is shutdown. You turn off. It's a catatonia that's been talked about earlier. 
Uh, here is also what we can do to help. Uh, and I just insist, I just copied this slide from two days ago at the APA. Uh, indeed, don't give antipsychotic. That's coming really in the last, very late. Self-injury frequent to uh, in autistic people, problem in differential diagnosis with uh, borderline personality disorder. A lot of medical co-occurrence, be attentive to that, help you to guide where to the diagnosis. And all the psychiatric problem you will have, uh, but you have some more frequent than other, like insomnia, like more anxiety, ADD, 40% uh, co-occurrence, substance abuse, we know it's there, it helps you to fit a lot of PTSD, OCD. Again, take the time, pause when you look the recording, and you will see all that information. I think it was important for me to tell you how we perceive the world and how that will affect our emotions and our psychiatric uh, problem, and the doctor need to be aware of that to make a proper uh, diagnosis. So this is um, very important. I'm sorry, I, I ran out of time so quickly. Important to remember, be calm, listen, trust the autistic person, even if they don't show what they are saying. Uh, medication in general, we are very sensitive to medication, go to low dose, believe the person if they tell you if they said effect, even at very low dose, tighter slowly. Uh, and here's a very great article when you have a good sense of giving the right context in which you can interview uh, someone and identify the autism, and then that will help you uh, to find the uh, psychiatric problem and how to help them. Thank you.